we have uh, strong established players, new players, and uh, I think that gives me m more optimism uh, than uh, on the energy front for the time being. But uh, uh, you have asked for the floor and, and want yeah. to comment, uh, Philip, I please. I just wanted to comment because uh, we've, uh, we focalize a bit on uh, uh, strategic raw materials uh, for uh, energy transition and so on. And uh, uh, what Hing has uh, said about phosphate is pretty important. Uh, it's clear that among all necessary materials for the future of humankind, there is one which can't be substituted. Uh, all metals, at one point or, no, or another, you can substitute one by another. I can substitute a bit cobalt by nickel and so on. Well, sometime. So if there is one product which you can't substitute, which you need for crops, for the development of crops, it's phosphates. And phosphates, that's very, very important. For the moment, I didn't consider it as such a, a dangerously strategic materials because we have a chance, uh, a good part of phosphate reserves. And the first uh, and the biggest producer of phosphate is uh, a fairly friendly country. It's Morocco. So for the moment, we don't have too much problem. But as far as... Uh, uh, fertilizers are concerned. If I have not a concern with phosphate, I have one with ammonia, so natural gas, and a last one with potash. And our, um, uh, our potash in Europe comes from two very nice countries, which are, which are Russia and Belarus. So don't forget fertilizers, uh, uh, which is not a, a high technology industry, but which is just necessary uh, to, al to allow us uh, and to allow 10 billion people to eat by the end of the century. But, but Philippe, as far as I understood, uh, uh, Ingville has just mentioned that uh, you have found uh, big deposits, especially of phosphate in Norway. Could you, could you tell us how much is that? And what is very interesting, I think, when could they go online? I mean, when could you go online with a production? You have a timetable uh, from finding to, uh, to the production. When can the EU and others uh, benefit from, from what you're doing there? Thank you so much for the question, and that's why we're so happy for the collaboration and the work that uh, Peter and, and his people is doing because they are pushing not only EU, but also the Norwegian government to have the licenses and the patents and everything to come to together to do this as soon as fast as uh, possible. For our concern, it's uh, on, only the governmental issues and the authorities that are, you know, prolonging the, the phase. But it has to be taken in, in the steps that, that's needed to do it in a sustainable way. But when it comes to sustainable issues, because I, I really uh, um, support the, the arguments that, you know, we, we don't want mining industry in Europe. But what's very good in, in the findings we have, which is approximately 70 billion tons of phosphate and vanadium, quite huge resources, it's open pit mines, uh, is that we have a highly educated people. It, it's down south in Norway, so we don't have the Sami issues. It's also found in a region where uh, the oil and gas industry is highly developed. It's just outside, uh, outside Stavanger, which is the uh, oil and gas capital, if you can say that in Norway. Uh, so the, the stakeholder engagement and contribution to this, this is, this is very good. Uh, we have a very good, in, excellent infrastructure around the findings with, with deep sea harbors. Abundancy, as, as you also know, of, of renewable energy in, in, in Norway. And because of Thank the you. future decrease, not now, I have to say that, so we don't make another issue of, of uh, Norway not being a provider of, of gas to, to Europe. Uh, but we know that the decrease in the oil and gas industry will happen. So the Norwegian politics, politicians from the left to the right 
is all very supportive to this uh, to this project because we need a, a job creation and we need indus new industry development and so the mining industry could be a part of that so the stakeholder the politicians not both national and regional are are very supportive to this and that's also thanks to thanks. peter and his thank people you. thank you uh, jonathan you you asked for the floor uh, may i uh, nevertheless uh, take up that question or that uh, remark from Ingvil. Um, in Norway, obviously, there is a consciousness and a willingness of the population that mining in Europe is, again, necessary. And they support it, obviously, there. And the areas there are not very much populated. How is it in uh, other countries in the world? What do you see when it comes to mining in Europe um, is there a change of attitude or is there still a lot of resistance against new projects? But, but uh, also your point, please. Yeah, I have two points, uh, basically, and I'm happy to answer with regards to, to the acceptance of mining as an industry in the, in the developed markets. But I would also like to add a few points with regards to um, the timing of, my, of, my, of, of project development. Um, so with regards of acceptance, um, in the industry and with the people. So the whole concept of ESG is not news to our industry. Mining has been do doing what is now subsumized under this term that was developed some five to ten years now in the making. Uh, for decades, we had interactions with the host communities forever. We always had, the, had an understanding of the responsibility towards our, the, the people and the communities and the environment. We called it social license to operate. Um, so the engagement that needs to happen before building a mine was, is always a, a core if of mining companies itself. And that needs to happen. It's a very actively managed process that needs to be institutionalized with the various uh, company it, itself. Um, so the engagement <coughs> process is something very important. And I personally, I also may not want to have a mine in the, in the backyard of my house, right? But uh, I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen. I think the understanding that the, the transition to the low carbon economy will not happen without mines is something that is not fully understood in my point of view, so it's an educational piece. And then when it comes to, um, to building a mine, the discussion with authorities and the licenses and their host countries is important, but it's equally important to interact and starting to interact very early on in the process before you set the first drill rig with the community surrounding. Now, coming back a bit to, uh, to, the, to the timing and your question, how quickly will ING will be producing? Depending on the commodity, building a mine takes 10 to 15 years. And that is not all bureaucracy and licensing, that's just a minor piece of it. It's just very diligent work that needs to go into building an economic mine. It's a lot of studies, a lot of work, a lot of people involved in bringing that on online. And it's a sometimes billion dollars investments. We're building an iron ore project in, uh, in Brazil at the moment. This is close to $5 billion investment. Um, so, and you're not doing this for producing five years or three years. You're doing this with a horizon of 30 years life of mine. So if you combine that, when we sit here together today, we need to take an investment decision for the next 50 years. So mine in, in its core is a very long-term business and we are very happy to subscribe to any standards at the time of investment decision, but we also urge policymakers to, after the time, not change the rules of the game. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just to complete what you said, the biggest greenfield investment in copper uh, is the mine of Oyutolgoi in Mongolia. I remember it was decided by the end of last century it took them 15 years to develop the first phase, and the second phase is not yet completed. So it's uh, more or less 20, 25 years later. Uh, and the second point I wanted to stress, uh, of course, France is not exactly the center of the world, but uh, uh, there won't be any mining in France. 
unfortunately. We had a project, by the way. It's not a strategic uh, uh, metal. It was gold in Guyana. You know, France has a small chunk of Latin America in Guyana. There was a project which was to, supposed to be a sustainable mine with all the precautions being taken in a country where we have a, a very a tough administration on that. It was the Montagne d'Or project in Guyana. And unfortunately, uh, it was uh, completely... Uh, a, it couldn't proceed because of the opposition, mainly of uh, uh, green NGOs, especially WWWF, uh, which was shared in France uh, by somebody who is by now uh, the chairman of the Environment Commission at the European Parliament. So that shows that uh, the NIMBY not in my backyard, uh, ID, uh, you have to take it at the size of a country and even on a continent. I'm very frankly doubtful about the capacity in Europe to develop new mining projects, and uh, I'm happy to know that uh, Norway uh, could be an exception. Well, well Peter, that, uh, we, we want to give that question to you. Uh, can the EU do something? Will it do something to speed up processes that we don't have to wait 20 years, uh, given the present situation? And can it do something for raising the consciousness that, for instance, for this Green Deal, uh, we need uh, mining, more mining, also in Europe? Please. Yes. So. What we cannot do is speed up the technical side of getting projects sure. up and running. And as the two previous speakers have said, you know, you actually have to work out the, the process models, you have to work out the geology, and it takes time to build facilities and bring them online. But where we do see huge uh, scope for improvement is speeding up the permitting processes. At the moment, um, in the European Union, and I think probably also in, in Norway, these are too slow too unpredictable, things get stuck, and uh, that's not the way to do it if you've got projects of strategic importance. So we're looking at best practices around the world and also at how we can improve things here. And we're talking very much to our environment colleagues uh, and those responsible for renewable energies because I don't know if you've noticed, but in the last few weeks we've proposed an emergency measure to push through the permitting of, of wind and solar projects because we absolutely need the, the ramp up of wind and solar in order to achieve our decoupling from Russian fossil fuels faster than, faster than originally planned. So we're going to have to look very much at what we can do on speeding up the permitting for, for mines or extraction sites or new industrial facilities. Um, and it means things like looking at creating a single a one-stop approach. It looks at parallel running of different permitting processes, having strategic impact assessment, uh, strategic environmental assessments before you start on the specific projects. It means nominating a coordinator who just makes sure that things don't get stuck and move forward expeditiously. And it also means making sure that you take a good close look at the judicial system so that there are no frivolous, uh, frivolous appeals which then get stuck in the court system for one, two or three years. There has to be a much more conscious approach to dealing with getting strategic projects uh, delivered without weakening environmental and social, social performance. Well, we have uh, three minutes left. Uh, that gives every one of you 45 seconds. You have uh, Mr. Raw Materials from the EU here. One message, what would you like to do the EU uh, to support you? What exactly do you need? Uh, I start with Ingvil, the politician. 45 seconds. <laughs> I'm not, uh, not yet a politician. I You're stopped being that when I joined Norge Mining. I, I think the, the main topic here is, is to coordinate the process to have it much faster done. We have done the identification phase. We're into the sele selection phase. So what we need is, is the coordination. And of course, a, new, a united world to, to, to be producers and... and uh, demanders for sustain, uh, sustainable processes in the mining industry. Thank you. Jonathan. 
Uh, we are founding members of an association called the Global Battery Alliance, together with the World Economic Forum, that is already 130 members from the public and the private space. And uh, we believe that a cooperation between the various entities, taking responsibility in our own hands, um, avoiding building parallel value chains, avoiding res uh, resource nationalism, but coming together in a joint effort in such a forum is the dominant strategy and we invite everyone um, to join our efforts. Thank you. Hey, Philippe. Well, uh, let's be positive. Uh, what is important in to be sustainable? Uh, with today's high prices, we have the means to be sustainable and perhaps to seize, because one of the problems, I uh, listened to what uh, uh, Peter said, uh, we more or less, we continue in Europe to export our environmental problems and to think that other will be uh, uh, will produce and uh, I don't know in what condition it will be in uh, uh, DRC and so on so with today's prices we might be able to develop new sustainable mines and I would say perhaps in Europe metallurgy because we focused on, me, on mine, remember that the real um, goulot d'étranglement, we say in French, so it, uh, my English doesn't come, the, the real problem is very often on the metallurgical side. Uh, we didn't speak of titanium, but the problem is not the minerals, it's uh, the making of titanium sponge, for example. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this was a great discussion. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to conclude with a quotation of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill in, 2000, uh, in 1914, when he was the first Lord of the British Admiralty, uh, said we have to change our whole fleet from coal to oil uh, as we want to compete with the German Navy. And then the Labour Party in Parliament said, well, that is insane because uh, then you make yourself re uh, uh, dependent on countries like Persia or today Azerbaijan uh, and that uh, we cannot accept. And then Churchill went again to the microphone in the, in the Houses of, Pal uh, houses of uh, Commons and he said, well, trust me, Energy security is about diversity, diversity, and diversity alone. And I think we can exactly say the same thing for critical raw materials. We have to look for diversity, and with the help of the EU and Peter, we will be able to achieve it, hopefully. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your uh, attendance. Uh, all the best and good luck to you in, with your projects.